In this video, we are going to be learning about the polarization of waves, especially light. And the best way to learn it is to experience it. So you're going to need a pair of polarizers or a pair of polarized sunglasses. The behavior of polarizers is that either one will let sunlight go through even when they overlap like this. But when they are crossed, they do not let light go through. Every student should get to try this for themselves. Regular light from the sun or a flashlight is unpolarized, but when we send it through a polarizer, it becomes polarized. In this case, vertically polarized. Then if you send it through yet another polarizer, sometimes called an analyzer, you might get no transmittance at all, especially if the polarizers are at right angles. This process of canceling light through polarizers is called extinction. The main lesson that can be learned from polarizers is that light travels as a transverse wave like the ones on this slinky. But I can polarize the wave and get it to oscillate in only one plane. No matter what crazy wave I try to send, only the horizontal components will get through. Unlike a mechanical polarizer, the optical polarizer has its molecules stretched perpendicular to the transmission axis. That is, long stretched polymers doped with iodine absorb a lot of their light in the same direction in which they are aligned. However, I will continue to use these diagrams to refer to the mechanical analogy. Now get ready for the big surprise. If we have two polarizers crossed to extinction, and then we add a third polarizer in between, we can still get light to pass through them. This experiment helps us understand what it means for something to be polarized. It means it's oscillating with a specific orientation as a vector, and a vector can be broken down into its components. It is these components that oscillate diagonally that can get through the triple polarizer. You can have a lot of fun by putting a polarizer in front of your computer screen, which is probably an LCD screen. These screens are linearly polarized, usually diagonally. It also happens on your watch and your calculator screen, which are also LCDs. I can prove that they're liquid by pushing on them. But your iPhone screen won't do this, even though it's an LCD, because these have windows that are circularly polarized. Some of the transmitted light is oscillating in a different plane. One application of cross polarizers is revealing the amount of stress in a transparent object. Rapid color changes demonstrate the locations where there is more stress. The revelation is made by the medium repolarizing the light between the two polarizers that have already been crossed to extinction. You can also see this by stretching transparent packaging tape too. If you have one, a good thing to put between these is a Prince Rupert's drop. These are made by dropping hot liquid glass into water and having it suddenly cool. The stress in the drop is demonstrated by its repolarizing of the light, but also by the fact that it easily shatters. Mouths closed. Holy moly. One of the main purposes of polarizers is to eliminate glare. You see, glare is either partially or completely polarized, whether it is glare on the surface of a tabletop or glare on water puddles. Glare tends to be polarized in the same plane as the object causing it. For example, the glare from this table is polarized left and right. Therefore, I know that my polarized sunglasses must admit light that is vertically polarized because they're supposed to eliminate glare. The blue sky is also a glare, but from the sun's scattered light on air molecules and it is partially polarized. The polarization is at a maximum at positions that are 90 degrees from the sun. Photographers sometimes use this to make the clouds look more dramatic, but I like to use it for fun to help me see the moon when it's out in the daytime. There are two types of 3D glasses that rely on polarization. Linear polarizers and circular polarizers. Linear polarizing glasses are pretty much like these filters, but with one vertical and the other horizontal. 
but circularly polarizing glasses like these have an extra plastic film that delays one component of the light wave, causing it to oscillate in a helix or moving circle. This plastic film can be removed, and what remains is just a linear polarizer. A typical experiment is to shine light through a polarizer and an analyzer and measure how changing the angle affects the amount of light getting through. For this purpose, you can use a flashlight or a slide projector or even a laser light which does not start out polarized and is probably the most convenient. We start out with the projector at maximum intensity. I've got the light landing on a solar cell which is connected to a millivolt meter. As the intensity decreases, the voltage decreases. Anyways, the result is supposed to be that the intensity depends on the cosine squared of the relative angle between the polarizers. It's a maximum at zero, a minimum at 90, and never negative. We think of the electric field vector as only getting its cosine component to pass through. And since energy is proportional to the square of the electric field, we square the cosine. The intensity function I've been describing is known as Malus's law. The Brewster angle occurs when the reflected ray is at 90 degrees to the refracted ray. But what angle is that? For example, for water? Well, we use Snell's law. n1 sine theta b equals n2 sine theta r. But the refracted angle is at 90 degrees to the Brewster angle. That is the complement. So we use the cosine, or complement sine, and then solving sine over cosine, we get tangent of theta b is n2 over n1. For water, the index of refraction is 1.33, so the Brewster angle is 53 degrees. We can verify this experimentally by shining a light on a puddle of water. And by using a ruler, we can determine the reflected angle, the Brewster angle. Now let's try it again for glass. You probably have a large pane of glass at your school. Have a friend stand equally distant from the glass as you, and then try to make their reflection disappear with a polarizer. When a clear substance is placed in a magnetic field, the field can reorient its polarization. This is known as the Faraday effect. Magnetism affects polarization. Set up the experiment by letting a laser pass through two polarizers and your sample, which can be anything, glass, sugar water, or in my case, an artificial crystal of terbium gallium garnet. First set the polarizers to extinction, then turn on the magnetic field. The more magnetism, the more change in the angle of polarization. This effect depends on the length of the substance and also on the wavelength of light used. But if these factors are controlled, then the ratio of angle to magnetic field should be a constant, which is called the Verdet constant, and it's different for every substance. Of course, polarization is not just a property of light waves, but of all electromagnetic waves, including radio and microwaves, and experiments are often done that involve these. And the construction of antennas often exploit polarization. If you have large polarizers, then by all means use your overhead projector to assist you with your demonstrations. But watch out, because some LCD projectors have unusual properties.